Okay, uh, welcome back everybody to the uh, 24 for 24, our sequel to last year's version. With me today is uh, Ryan Kimmel and Fei He, part of the macro team here at Double Line. We've combed through uh, over 8,000 slides that we presented internally to the Double Line team over the course of the year to try to hone in on uh, 24 that we think are going to be the most relevant for this year. With our first slide, we're going to show you is the uh, expectation for recession that we had coming into 2023. On the screen is the uh, Google Trends recession search trends uh, against the Bloomberg consensus expectation for one year uh, recession. We've drawn a dotted line at the start of the year to highlight the fact that as we came into 2023, there was a very high expectation for recession. Uh, as you look over the length of this chart, you can see really only during recessions did you have recession expectations get so large, and really it was after the recession started. The shaded area is when recessions um, were, were already uh, underway. So it was the most expected recession ever, um, and it was a recession, the most expected recession that didn't materialize. I think uh, we showed a version of this chart in our presentation last year and probably flagged it as one of the more important charts for 2023. What we see on the screen is the expected uh, growth rate for the U.S. for the end of 2023, basically where we are today, against the uh, expectations for inflation uh, this year as well. And as you will, as you will note, um, at the beginning of this year, growth was expected to be basically flat. It was zero. You can barely see it there. And as the year progressed, uh, actually, it, growth was expected to be slightly negative. Uh, meanwhile, inflation all the way up top, the line is more or less where we started the year. So that is what was expected by the market participants for this year. And really, inflation's coming in where it was expected. The real big divergence as, is where I started, um, which is basically the U.S. growth. Rather than uh, a very weak year of economic growth in the U.S., it turned out to be quite strong. Uh, we have a quote down below from Mike Tyson that everybody's heard by now. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And I think for a lot of market participants, uh, they were set up for a year of declining inflation and modest growth. We had that declining inflation. We had very strong growth. And I think the difference there of the growth is really explains a lot for, uh, really explains a lot of um, how we saw investment returns play out across fixed income and equities this year. The next chart we're gonna go through, it looks at cross asset performance for 2023 versus 2022. And there's a lot of assets on here. I think it's 48 different. Um, it's not really as important how the rankings look. It's really, if you'll note, there's almost a um, mirror image returns. Those assets that were very negative last year, uh, tend to be the blue that are below the line, are the best performers this year and vice versa. Commodities had a weak 2023 and had a very strong 2022. <clears throat> Likewise, many equity markets were down pretty strongly in 2022 and they've had the reverse expectation this year. So this year, in terms of assets, is very much a mirror uh, reflection of last year. So I think this slide really encapsulates what had played out in global financial markets in 2023. And what you can see is that for, for risk assets, uh, including equities and credit and currencies, implied volatilities declined steadily throughout the year. Vice versa of that though, interest rate volatility, as you can see by the elevated blue line on this chart, uh, stayed very high at le similar levels that we saw in, in 2022. And what was driving this divergence in implied volatility? I think primarily it was of risk assets uh, endorsing the view of a, of a soft landing as inflation uh, decelerated quite materially throughout the year. And that was on a backdrop of uh, growth expectations improving as we saw in a, in a previous chart. And the reason why interest rate volatility uh, stayed elevated throughout the year, I think it was a combination of this uh, re-rating of, of growth expectations higher in 2023 and that coinciding with the market uh, having some indigestion absorbing the uh, glut of supply of treasuries uh, 
um, on the back of you know, very high issuance given the deficit spending that we saw. Okay, next up, uh, we have a slide showing uh, the consecutive months that global manufacturer PMI has been below 50. 50 is usually the marker for when uh, an economy is in expansion or contraction. And although this is not specific to the US, it's a global number, you can see here that we're basically at uh, the approaching or at the all time highs, which was uh, last revisited back in the early 2000s of uh, the number of months in contraction. I think as I look across the data this year and the slides that we presented and the discussions that we had, um, I'm really struck by the number of indicators that um, reflect a recession is in progress or very near term across the board. I've made the comment internally that um, we're not in a business cycle, we're in a post-pandemic cycle. Okay, the next chart we're going to look at looks at the ratio of U.S. job openings to unemployed workers. Um, one of the most uh, interesting facts of this post-pandemic world has been the um, dynamic in the labor market of uh, more job openings and demand for uh, workers than there have been for workers. Um, I would argue there's a number of reasons for this, uh, probably having to do with immigration, um, folks changing careers, moving, uh, early retirees, some of the more negative aspects of the pandemic, likely disabilities and potentially death. But the end result of all of that is that we still are in an environment today that although normalizing um, has uh, basically an imbalance of uh, supply and demand of the workforce. That is translated into high wages, which is itself translated into higher inflationary pressures. So it's, an, it's a very important um, aspect of the economy to track. I tend to think that this dynamic will stay elevated uh, as opposed to the pre-pandemic period, but it is uh, quickly normalizing. Where we'll settle out will be uh, the question that will probably get answered in 2024. So what this shows here is household and nonprofit liquid assets as a percent of GDP. So what are those liquid assets? That includes money markets, that includes uh, checking deposits, and uh, time deposits, saving deposits. So, um, you know, very liquid holdings on household balance sheets. And what you can see is just the remarkable rise that we saw in these liquid assets in the aftermath of the, the pandemic as the government injected trillions of dollars of, of stimulus in, into the economy. And this large influx of, of, of liquidity into the, into the system really supported uh, consumption uh, particularly in, in 2022 and in 2023 as households drew down on, on excess savings to, to support consumption. So, you know, the question going forward as we head into 2024 is, you know, how, how long are these um, excess savings going, going to last to support uh, consumption going forward? And if you look under the hood at the, the distribution of, of households that are you know, holding these, these liquid assets, it's you know, disproportionately um, in the high income cohorts. And it does look like that the lower income cohorts have completely exhausted some of those you know, pandemic excess savings, um, which could weigh on economic activity uh, in the quarters ahead. And what we did here was we tried to identify which sectors of the labor market had a higher sensitivity uh, to the inflection points in the economy. So from a technical perspective, we ran correlations against the, leading the conference board leading economic indicator. And we can see on the orange line here, that shows sectors of the labor market that are not cyclically sensitive. Um, or not sensitive to the economy. So this would include like the healthcare sector, um, government, labor, employment, um, utilities. And what you can see is that over the last, say 12 months, uh, the, the employment growth has been very strong within this non-cyclically uh, sensitive uh, cohort. And then vice versa to that, the blue line, this shows employment sectors that are cyclically sensitive. Um, which would include uh, temporary help services, different portions of, of manufacturing, transportation. 
And I think a key point that I'd highlight is that if you look at previous cycles, it's these cyclically sensitive sectors that tend to soften first in the months ahead of a recession, as you can see in 2007 and in 99 into 2000. And currently at this point in the cycle, you are starting to see some of that softening um, in these uh, you know, more cyclically sensitive uh, cohorts of, of employment. So definitely something to watch uh, in, in the new year. And on the chart here in front of us, uh, we see what the, in the top panel is the current mortgage rate, which is the line, and then the shaded area is the effective interest rate of all mortgages outstanding. So if you were in the market for a house, your mortgage rate at one point went up to nearly 8%. If you had a mortgage, you were sitting pretty with a uh, mortgage rate of uh, under 4%, uh, generally, or, or on average, about 3.2%. So uh, for those with already mortgages already borrowing, Fed could hike away, really didn't impact uh, the, their borrowing. And similarly for corporate America, corporate America as well took strong advantage of the low rates over the last couple of years, locked in long-term financing. And for those that had to come to market more recently, they of course had to pay market rates. We all on the fixed income side benefit from these higher um, market rates. But for the most part, um, borrowers I would say in the US have been sitting pretty okay with uh, locked in financing rates, both on the consumer side and the corporate America. As time goes on, if rates stay higher, of course this will be something that will have to be reckoned with, but that will probably be a tale for 2024, probably more likely 2025 and beyond. As this chart shows, a year ago when inflation rate was at 9.1%, the Fed fund rate was less than 2%. It created an urgency that Fed needs to hike rate as fast as they can. Today, things have flipped as inflation has come down substantially. The upper band of Fed funds rate was 5.5% versus inflation rate 3.1%. It sounds quite restrictive. When we look into 2024, the expectations are inflation will continue to moderate into mid or low 2%. And given that inflation outlook, it seems that the market already pricing the Fed fund rates will come down next year as well, synchronized with the inflation outlook. This chart shows the U.S. headline inflation contributions. Nearly all the inflation contribution came from core services. Core services refers to housing, healthcare, transportation, food services, and financial services, etc. In 2024, we see both upside and downside risks to core services. So we might expect further deceleration in core services or inflation could be a bumpy ride going forward. And we learned that core services are tightly linked to the labor market and the wage growth. So what we did here was we, we overlaid wage growth as, as proxy from the Atlanta Fed wage growth tracker. And we overlaid it with the quits rate with a, a nine month lead. And you can see there's a pretty strong relationship here, even, even accounting for, for this lead. And what the takeaway here is that, you know, even though wage growth has been you know, very persistent and, and above historical levels, uh, it does look like, based on the quits rate, that wage growth should continue to normalize back to you know, levels we saw in the, the pre-pandemic -pan era. What we show here on the chart, on the top panel, is uh, two indices that are normalized, basically, um, at the same point, started 100, and the growth rate you can see from there. Uh, we see that the Zillow Rent All Index line and the Average Hourly Earnings Index indices both grew roughly at the same rate up until more or less the end of 2020. That is to say, rents more or less grew with wages for the most part, uh, basically for about eight years. This chart goes back 10 years. And in the lower panel, there's, there's a ratio of rent to average hourly earnings to that index. And what you will see is that essentially starting the beginning of 2021, think pandemic reopening, think people moving from 
Los Angeles to Rocky Mountain states and so on, uh, we saw rents nationally increase dramatically, really start to rise. And although wages grew, as we've been highlighting, at a higher clip, at a higher average, a higher number than they had been growing before the pandemic, way, uh, rents actually outstripped that. And for the average consumer, they're still sort of dealing with that. And if you look in the lower panel here, you can still see, and really in both, you can still see that the, uh, even though uh, U.S. rents, the rental year-over-year -year change is moderating, and wages, as we've already shown you, are moderating, actually a little bit less, you're still, you're, the average consumer still finds rent, rent levels that are much higher than their wages <laughs> were five years ago. And so, yes, the month over month and year over year inflation numbers are declining. The rate of change is slowing back to zero. The price level is actually at a much higher level than it was five years ago. And so for a consumer, I don't think they really care what we in the financial markets see as uh, uh, our calculated inflation rates. They see that their uh, rent rate is you know, up 20, 30, 40, 50% in some cases versus five years ago, and their wages are not up that much. Consumers are still left dealing with the, um, uh, the ramifications of 9% CPI, even for a brief period of time, and 20, 30% year-over-year increases in rents. The rise in these price levels, you know, coinciding with a very strong labor market and you know, risk assets that have rallied you know, quite a bit, under that sort of scenario, you would typically uh, you know, imagine that consumer sentiment would be pretty elevated and we're not really seeing that right now. If you look at like University of Michigan consumer sentiment data, that still remains pretty muted. And I really think that's driven in large part by this you know, large rise we've seen in prices over the last few years. It's gonna probably take a while before uh, the consumer has sort of caught up with the yeah. rental increases and inflation increases we had over the last couple of years. So it could mean we see polling and survey and consumer sentiment stay much weaker than we expected. And it's in my mind to take it even a step further than further, um, I think it's probably not a really good indicator on the economy right now because consumers are still left dealing with this very high level of inflation we've been going through. And what this chart shows here is the amount of cuts priced by developed market central banks. So. You could see the orange line here, that's the amount of cuts priced by the Fed for, for 2024. The blue line is the amount of cuts priced by the ECB for the same period. And then the green shows a similar metric for, for the Bank Bank of England. And what you can see is over the last uh, couple of months or so, we've seen a pretty significant decline, or I guess said another way, uh, rise in the amount of cuts being priced for 2024. And that really coincided with the inflation data um, that was released during November coming in uh, much softer than expected, not only in the US, but in, in Europe as well. And in Europe, they are, looks like they're facing a, a technical recession um, this quarter. They had a negative uh, real GDP print for, for Q3. It looks like another uh, negative print will be likely for Q4, uh, especially if you look at some of the um, you know, business and consumer sentiment data over there. Um, so it does look like the ECB has some um, definitely significant backing um, that could drive these, these cuts and have them come to fruition in, in 2024. But what we have overlaid is the yield on the U.S. 10-year Treasury. Uh, and what I want to really draw attention to is really from the, the midpoint on of this year, call it you know, the end of June, the 10-year Treasury more or less started trading in lockstep with expectations for Fed cuts for next year. So when the Fed was expected to cut less, we saw U.S. interest rates rise. And more recently, as we just explained, when the market was starting to uh, go back to the assumption that the Fed would be cutting uh, even more next year, we saw rates rally. And we're showing both of these uh, slides in tandem because as we think about next year and as the scenario I just laid out, data comes in better, market starts pushing back Fed expectations, data starts coming in worse, and I'm specifically talking about economic data. It's likely that we'll see um, some, uh, probably not as much as the last couple of years, but we'll probably see some continued volatility um, play out in interest rates. And I'll say that I do think interest rate volatility will come down next year because we don't have the big, we likely don't have the big elephant in the room, which is a massive spike in inflation. I think 
on the go-forward basis, we're really talking about economic growth and the risks are probably to the downside. So um, we'll have rates move around along with Fed expectations, but it's likely to be a lot more contained than the last couple of years. Today, there truly is a gargantuan amount of money on the sidelines. And in fact, over the course of this year, the amount of money that's come into money markets only captured by, the, by, the, um, this, by ICI is over $1 trillion. For context, the U.S. high yield market is about $1.2 trillion. So we've seen enough money come in the money markets on top of what was already there, which itself grew before the pandemic to nearly amount to the size of the U.S. Um, high yield market. Another point I will mention was that this money back in 2007, 8, 9, it stayed pretty sticky. Um, even as you can see here, even as uh, interest rates came down, we've drawn a dotted line to highlight the peak in money market assets back in, I think that's uh, 2009. Uh, you can see even as yields came back to zero, only then when rates were at zero did money finally start coming out of uh, money market funds. And so while I think we could look at this chart and uh, be very constructive on uh, money coming out of money markets and where it might go. Personally, I think it's going to um, go back to banks to some degree. Uh, I also think it's going to go back to bond markets and surely it'll spill out to other markets. But uh, um, there's every expectation that the Fed will cut about 100 basis points next year, which would still leave us at a money market yield roughly of about 4%. Uh, if the pass is any indicator, it's probably likely that this money will be stickier than most of us want, but we'll keep hearing about it. And I know, you know, here at Double Line, we track this and look at this every week when the data comes out. Um, it's surely uh, a, a lot of money that will be um, flowing out into asset markets at some point over the next few years. So this chart here, the key takeaway is the, the starting yield matters. So what this chart shows is a scenario analysis for, for high yield, uh, total return for 12 months for different spread and default scenarios. And what you can see is there's an asymmetry here. So given the starting yield, it really provides a cushion uh, to absorb losses from default and, and, and spread widening. So take, for example, if spreads widened out to a 450 basis points from the current levels and you had about 5% default rates, which is generally kind of what the market is expecting and projecting for 2024, you'd actually see positive returns of just around 3%. The same applies pretty much across the board to fixed income, whether you're looking at mortgages, um, very high starting yield, and really the um, upside scenarios versus downside um, are really in favor of upside. Uh, you can look across structured finance, you can look at bank loans with yields uh, well over 9%. So there's a lot of yield available in fixed income, really the most we've seen in over 20 years, that will really serve to uh, buffer against adverse scenarios going forward, whether that be unexpected inflation, stronger growth, rising default rates. It's a very different scenario from perhaps where we were about five years ago, where rates were very low and any bad scenario would have created basically where we've ended up in the last two years. We're at a very high level of yield now versus where we were two years ago when we've had this monster inflation that really uh, led to very negative returns in fixed income. So I think as, uh, as investors and fixed income investors, it's really important to take into consideration that um, there's a lot of yield available in fixed income markets to really cushion against uh, unexpected downward surprises. So what we have on the screen here is uh, around the topic that I think uh, we've heard a little bit about and we'll probably start hearing a lot more about into 2024, which is the so-called maturity wall. It basically means when you look at uh, bonds, when you start having a wave of a high level of bonds that come mature, come due, uh, those need to be refinanced. And if they were originally, uh, the borrower was borrowing in a very low rate environment and has to refinance in a very high rate environment, there's a difference there. And that difference either needs to be um, that the, the money needs to come up with by the borrower, whether that is um, through their own pocket or through other lenders. I mean, there's a variety of ways or defaults. There's a number of ways that this can come to fruition. So the chart on the right here looks at the number of, or the percentage of high yield debt that is due within two years. And uh, this chart is courtesy of Barclays. I wanna give them uh, credit for that. Uh, over the last five, six, seven years, generally about uh, 4% of the high yield market was maturing in the following 24 months. 
and that was in a low rate environment. Now here in 2023, we have about, that number's doubled. It's not a massive number, but you're up to about 7% of the high yield market that will mature in the next couple of years. I'll just, you can't see it in the chart here. I'll let you know much of this is in coming in 2025. So I think as, long, as we're in this higher for longer environment, if we end up in that, that environment uh, through the course of this year, market participants will start being more focused on maturities coming due in 25 and 26. We already see it in some areas of bank loans where those bank loans that are coming uh, mature more quickly tend to be the more distressed loans. So I don't really think this is a topic quite yet, but I think as we get through 20, midpoint of 2024 and beyond, and if interest rates are still, call it elevated, however you want to define that, this will be a topic um, that will become more into consideration. we've separated three different periods. Um, there's the pre-GFC period, uh, which is basically 1997 to 2007. There is the post-GFC period up until the pandemic, which is basically 2010 to 2019. And then we have the latest. Um, and so when I think people talk about uh, higher for longer, underlying that is basically the concept that we are no longer in the post-GFC uh, period. And so what we see on this chart here, starting all the way off on the right, is the 10-year tips yield, which uh, is currently at 1.97. However, during the, um, the period up until the pandemic, it was a, a meager 0.39. But before GFC, back in uh, before 2007, that number was 2.85. Um, you also see that the, most, the latest uh, print for the five-year tips yield is 2.04. The period after GFC up until the pandemic was actually negative 0.20, uh, actually earning uh, less, less yield than nominal bond. Uh, and the uh, pre-GFC uh, yield was 2.5%. Next over from that is the Bloomberg US corporate real yield. Um, and the real yield was 2.2% uh, most recently. The post-GFC period was 1.63 and the pre-GFC, again, before 2007, was 3.47. In all instances, you can get the flavor of three different regimes here where before GFC, the uh, real yield uh, was higher. The yield you get after inflation was higher. Uh, and then it fell dramatically uh, after the global financial crisis. And then more recently, it's ha it has a look that is more similar uh, to the uh, pre-07 period. Now, we're, it will, remains to be seen how this will sort of play out, but you hear a lot of uh, people talking about the higher for longer. I think there's a lot of uh, reasons to think that might make sense. Uh, reverse globalization, demographics, uh, reshoring, all of these, these sort of um, fun, uh, factors that are, that are out there. Um, lastly, all the way off to the left is uh, the S&P earning yield. Now the earning yield of the S&P is the flip side of PE. Uh, it's a way to try to equate um, equity yields to, to fixed income. And what you'll note, again, is three regimes, but this time it looks a little different. The um, earning yield of the 2000 time period was uh, a lot higher, basically, than it was in the pre-GFC period and more recently. And I think that speaks to the uh, effect of low rates on asset prices. Your PE ratio is higher and your earning yield uh, was a lot higher as well. On the left here, we see the seasonal returns going back to 2008 uh, by month for municipal closed-end funds. And we've got average numbers, we've got medians, and I just wanna draw your attention to the different colors, particularly around uh, the fall and the beginning of the year. And what you can see is that generally in September and October, these funds are almost always uh, have negative returns, have a general recovery in November and December, and almost always have a positive return in January. There's a lot of talk about tax loss selling, and I think that is the primary thing that we're seeing here, but it's in its purest essence. It's really hard to track, I think, tax loss selling across most assets, but uh, particularly municipal closing bond fund investors tend to be very tax uh, focused on the right hand side. If you look on now to the right hand side, what we have here are uh, the returns from November to January in the first column, and then February to October in the second column. And if you look at the uh, uh, annualized median return of that those two respective time periods, so you invest in November, um, 
and you hold till January, or you invest in February and hold till October. The annualized return of doing the buying in November is 20% and the annualized return of buying in February is 5.5%, which is a massive difference. Um, and I think if you look at this chart, it is really uh, something that you, you, I think most investors, or at least uh, individual investors, should look at uh, on an annual basis. It's just really uh, taking advantage of tax loss selling. And I want to you know, thank again Goldman for this chart. Um, this is their forecast of treasury issuance. And as some may know, Goldman is much more constructive on the economy than most. So this is not a recessionary forecast. And as um, anyone that follows our work here at Double Line knows, uh, when, the, when a recession occurs, the US government tends to borrow even more. The deficits go down or up, depending on how you want to look at it, and they borrow more. And so if we find ourselves in a recessionary scenario, then you should expect uh, even more issuance than Goldman has here. Uh, another uh, aspect to this, which, you know, sort of putting out there some of the risks for fixed income, because I think the, the opportunities are plenty, is um, if you look at some of the major buyers in fixed income uh, that have stepped back this year, it's primarily been the central bank, the Fed, uh, and banks, largely a result, as a result of the banking crisis earlier this year. And uh, retail, in many ways, individual investors have really stepped in um, as we look forward to next year. Not clear exactly um, what banks will do, although there's you know, some discussion that the banks may start buying again. It seems, as for now, that the Fed will not step back in. I'll, I'll speculate that if we have a recession, that may or may not change. Um, and when you look at various measures of exposure by bond fund managers, um, it's hard to get your fingers around this, but whether you look at estimates of duration or, or whatnot, it appears that um, bond fund managers do tend to have a pretty decent sized exposure. So to the extent there is an upside surprise in issuance next year, I think that that also will become a risk factor. Um, if we have a stronger economy um, and uh, more issuance, that could um, present probably not as much as this year and last year, but could present some more volatility in the coming year for uh, fixed income. On the screen now is a look at the consecutive weeks or the streak of time that the two tens U.S. Treasury yield curve has been inverted. We're currently, as we're recording this, at 75 weeks. The record was 89, set back in uh, April 1980, which was also a period that experienced some high inflation. And uh, beyond the signal that most people look at for yield curve inversion for what it means about a recession, um, it also has big implications for the financial system, uh, starting with the banking system. The banking system tends to rely on a positively sloping yield curve. If you think about it, uh, banks tend to borrow uh, from depositors in the short run and lend to companies and mortgage borrowers in the long run. So they want to borrow sh uh, with as cheap as rates possible and lend with as long as rates as possible. So having a positive sloping yield curve is very beneficial to banks. The same holds for other financials, whether it is REITs or closed in funds, as we previously mentioned, uh, or really any leveraged vehicle relies on a positive sloping yield curve. So when the yield curve is inverted, it can tend to cause volatility and stress within the financial system. And I think that we saw a very bright episode or dim episode, I should say, of that uh, earlier this year with the uh, banking crisis that occurred around SVB. One of the more interesting uh, equity slides and equity stories from this year has been the dramatic outperformance of uh, a few companies within the S&P relative to the breadth of the S&P. On the chart that we're showing you now is the regular S&P 500. By regular, I mean it's a, a capitalization weighted, the one that we look at every day. And that is a ratio to the equal weighted S&P, where each company is uh, in equal percentage, basically. And back in 2020, we saw the biggest companies outperform uh, the smallest or the breadth of the S&P. And that got unwound over the course of 2021. Roll, roll forward to 2023, we, say, we see as well, uh, the biggest companies start to outperform uh, the S&P equal weighted. You see terms thrown around like Magnificent Seven a few years ago or last year, it was the Fangs. And very recently, um, during the last month or so, we've seen some uh, give back of that excess performance. It, it is also coincided uh, 
with the peak in uh, interest rates that we saw back in late uh, October 2023. So as we look forward into 2024, it will be interesting to watch how this uh, theme develops. Will we see equal weighted outperform the capitalization weighted or will the bigger companies, the AI driven companies continue to sort of outperform? As we think about some of the other risk factors for 2024, we have to bring uh, to investors' attention uh, how many elections there will be globally. On the screen, courtesy of Bloomberg, there is uh, 40 countries with elections next year. That's about 21%. By GDP, that is about 42% uh, of the world will have uh, elections next year. Some of those range from countries like Taiwan to Russia um, and most importantly for us here in the U.S. would be the U.S. election. Uh, hard to tell exactly how the market will start digesting this as we get towards the middle of the year. I think there's a number of ways to look at this. There's the question of how uh, a different administration might uh, deploy or spend its fiscal resources and that impact that might have on interest rates. There is the actual election process itself that may introduce volatility into markets. I don't think uh, that markets really start thinking about that until we get towards the midpoint of this year. Back in 2023, I think markets were still concerned in the first half of the year with inflation and then that transition to more of growth concerns. I think as we enter 2024, we'll be, uh, markets will be very focused on U.S. growth uh, as uh, inflation is receding into the backdrop and then uh, the, the election cycle will start feeding in. Generally, elections aren't the most, um, uh, don't, don't introduce the most volatility into markets, but I think it will certainly be something that we'll be, have to start watching as we get towards the middle of uh, next year. As we start looking forward to 2024, investors should be very focused on the U.S. economy. They should be relaxed about uh, inflation in the U.S. and they should feel that the Fed has their back essentially with the market assuming the Fed's going to cut. Now, while they may not cut as quickly as the market expects, they're more likely than not to cut than to hike. As we think about what that backdrop means for investing overall, it's a pretty good environment for fixed income. I think investors also thought this was the case in 2023, but now we have higher starting yields. We have inflation that is absolutely lower than it was at the start of 2023. Uh, and we have a lot more indicators in growth that are looking softening. While I'm not personally convinced that uh, we're gonna see a recession per se, I do have to accept all of the uh, uh, economic data points which are continuing to soften. So with all that in mind, uh, we wanna wish our investors a happy and safe 2024, and thank you for watching.